I'd like to welcome all of you to today's conference on law, genomic medicine, and health equity. How can law support genomics and precision medicine to advance the health of underserved populations? I'm Susan Wolf from the University of Minnesota, one of the co-organizers of today's conference. I want to thank all of you here in the auditorium and our many participants by webcast. Uh, we have a really illustrious group here and by remote, and we've set up ways for everyone to participate. Lots of mics here in the room and an email address. I'll uh, re-announce that in a little bit so that uh, people by webcast, we really hope that you'll be weighing in with questions and comments. Uh, before we begin our formal agenda, uh, it's my enormous privilege to introduce uh, two distinguished guests up here to the podium to give us a formal welcome. First, we're going to hear from Dr. Veronica Mallet, who is Senior Vice President for Health Affairs and Dean of the School of Medicine here at Meharry Medical College. And she'll be followed by Dean Maria Lima, who is Dean of the School of Graduate Studies and Research and Interim Vice President for Research and Innovation here at Meharry. Dr. Mallet. Well, good morning, everyone. A warm Meharry welcome to our campus. I understand that we have a, a wide uh, audience online. And uh, if you hadn't already mentioned, our hashtag for tweeting is hashtag genomic equity. Genomic equity. I wanted to confirm that. Um, and so for those of you uh, who are on Twitter, we want to keep the Twitter feed live and uh, the discussion going today. Um, you've already heard uh, as to who I am. I'd like to just share with you a little bit about Meharry, because Meharry is a, a jewel of Nashville, but if you are, have time to spend in our fair city, you may tell people that you spent the day on Meharry's campus and they might say, hmm, where is that? And so sometimes, uh, uh, to quote our representative Jim Cooper, you can have a prophet in your own town and it's little recognized. Meharry is 143 years old. It is a health science center with a school of dentistry, a school of medicine, which we take 115 students per year, a graduate school for biomedical science with uh, many research endeavors dedicated to eliminating health disparities with the goal of achieving health equity. And we have in our mission statement that we are committed to serving the underserved and achieving health equity and eliminating health disparities. So the, it is fitting that you are here today as we are collectively partnering to understand how the intersection of law, genomic and precision medicine can help to uh, eliminate health disparities and, and achieve health equity. I am excited to uh, welcome you as you begin your work today and continue this effort. And I hope that you enjoy your time here on your campus. I hope you enjoyed your good southern breakfast. I'm sure their portions and the selection was somewhat astonishing, this being a health, health science center. <laughs> but that is the Southern way. So thank you all for coming. Good morning. Good morning. We uh, warmed the town up for you. On Monday, we are at, were at 19 degrees. I know it's for some of you, like Minnesota, it's not a big deal, but we were freezing. <laughs> and so again, it's also my pleasure to welcome all of you to this national conference. And uh, I want to thank and welcome all the participants from out of town and also our large audience uh, that is taking this or looking at this through a webcast. And I heard it's about 250 of you. So I'm very happy to, that you can participate. So this conference is the first to address how law, policy, and policy can support 
access to precision and genomic medicine, supporting community engagement, protecting privacy, protecting against discrimination, and making sure that people feel safe to contribute genomic information to large databases, and of course, then protecting access to the fruits of that research in genomic medicine. Pretty powerful stuff. We're excited to welcome a very a great line of speakers to address these concerns and make new proposals to aid progress. And as I said, we're also very excited that there is a large webcast audience. So we're aiming for a real dialogue, very much hope that everybody will contribute insights and expertise. We'll have microphones for those here in the audience and for those joining us by webcast email our comments, and I am going to give the email address, which is going to be repeated a lot of times, uh, so you can convey it to the moderators. The email address is c-o-n-s-o-r-t-m at u-m-n dot e-d-u. So in addition to webcasting, we're videotaping to post on the web for free public access. We'll be posting on the website of the University of Minnesota's Consortium on Law and Values, http consortiumumn.edu. And everybody will be emailed when the videotape is posted, and we hope you feel free to share and use it for discussion, teaching, going back, etc. Because as I was discussing this before, it is a lot to absorb, so we need a pause. And so all of, the, all of us over 25 may take some time to uh, take a look at this. Uh, finally, I would like to, of course, thank the speakers for coming and sharing, and my colleagues here at Vanderbilt, Meharry Vanderbilt and Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance, and their wonderful staff for their hard work in supporting their conference, including Carolyn Deal, Kim Event, Virginia Fuqua, Matt Shore, Donnie Frierson, Kat Catherine Grimes, and Audrey Bow. And I hope you have a wonderful conference. I'll be going in and out because life is difficult in a campus that you can't get away from, but I'll be seeing you a little later. Thank you. Um, uh, I'm Ellen Wright Clayton. I am one of the co-organizers of this conference, and I am uh, a member of the faculty at Vanderbilt University and Vanderbilt University Medical Center. Um, and I want to say what an enormous pleasure it is to be here. Um, as you know, Vanderbilt University Medical Center is a real leader um, in uh, the implementation of genomic medicine and um, is actually the data center for the All of Us Consortium, and uh, has also had a major presence in, uh, examining the ethical, legal, and social implications of genomics uh, now for uh, many decades. Uh, and, and I think, I just want to say a word about what led to this conference. I mean, in part, um, we collaborate with the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance and have for a long time. Um, as part of all of this work in genomics. But I think what really brought us to the table was that Vince Bonham from NHGRI at an earlier meeting of the, of the Law Seek Consortium said to us, I challenge you to address the issue of disparities in access to genomics, genomic medicine. And, um, and frankly, uh, uh, under the leadership of my colleagues, um, this conference has really come to fruition. We know that genomics has actually been focused on uh, people of Northern European ancestry for decades, and, um, and we need to change that. And so this conference, I think, is actually the first that really allows us to address the complexity of these issues. So I am so grateful for my colleagues for their um, work in organizing this, for our fabulous speakers who are coming, um, and who I hope um, by their wise words will help, uh, help lead us into the future. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful. So let me do a little more uh, thanking and housekeeping and then we can dig into it. We are videotaping 
uh, as Dean Lima said, so that we can archive this on the consortium website at the University of Minnesota. Uh, and that's for free public access, for sharing, for teaching, for going back and looking at it for any further events people want to sponsor. Uh, and I want to just reiterate thanks to uh, the many colleagues across all three institutions, Meharry, Vanderbilt, and the University of Minnesota, without whom we, none of us would be here. Uh, Audrey Boyle, Catherine Grimes, Carolyn Deal, Kim Avant, Virginia Furqua Meadows, Brenda Sterrett, Matt Shore, Donnie Frierson. Uh, Dean Lima recited these names, but we can't thank them enough. And can you help me in thanking them now? Uh, this uh, conference is co-sponsored by the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance, by Vanderbilt University Medical Center, uh, by the Consortium on Law and Values in Health, Environment, and the Life Sciences at the University of Minnesota, which I chair, and uh, by the Minnesota Precision Medicine Collaborative at the University of Minnesota. Uh, the conference is part of an NHGRI, NCI-funded project uh, on LAWSEEK, L-A-W-S-E-Q, LAWSEEK, building a sound legal foundation for translating genomics into clinical application, which is co-led by myself, by Ellen, and by our colleague Francis Lorenz from the University of Minnesota with a all-star national working group, many of whom are here today and going to be participating. We're going to reconvene tomorrow as a smaller working group as we gel uh, some of our written recommendations and we very much want to be led and informed by what we learn and, um, and hear at today's conference. Uh, we are thrilled that this conference is going to result in a published symposium that will appear in the peer-reviewed journal Ethnicity and Disease, and that symposium is going to be co-edited by Professor Marino Bruce, who is Research Associate Professor of Medicine, Health, and Society at Vanderbilt, by Vince Bonham, Jr. I'm so glad, Ellen, that you acknowledged Vince's key role in bringing us here today. Vince is Senior Advisor to the Director at the National Human Genome Research Institute at NIH uh, on genomics and health disparities. And I'm going to trail along and help as well. So the three of us are going to co-edit that published symposium. Uh, you've got our agenda. Uh, a really tremendous agenda of great speakers here to really instigate what we hope will be a dialogue. Uh, I wanted to thank our great faculty planning committee, including Professors Consuelo Hopkins Wilkins, Ellen Wright Clayton, Marino Bruce, and Pamela Jacobson. Uh, because we're uh, videotaping and webcasting, please do silence your pagers and your phones and your other devices. Um, we are going to have a break for about 15 minutes at 11.30. And for those of you here with us, refreshments are in the ballroom. I keep thinking one of these days we'll be technologically sophisticated enough so that the webcast people can get refreshments too by remote, but we're not there yet. You know, beam me up, Scotty. We're not there yet, one day. So we're going to do that at 11.30, and then we're going to come back here promptly at 11.45, so it's a short break for our first panel presentation. At 1 o'clock, we will break for lunch and go to the ballroom where you can grab your box lunch, and we're thrilled that Professor Wilkins will be um, presenting the lunch presentation. So for questions and comments, we've got these two mics that you see. It would be wonderful when you come to the mic if you could just briefly say your name and introduce yourself so we can all get to know each other. For those of you by webcast, please, please email us. This is the consortium email address, so it may look a little foreign. We'll flash it up later. But it's consort M, which is a short version of consortium. So C O N S O R T M 
at umn.edu. So that's our University of Minnesota email address. And as soon as you do that, we will run it up to the moderator who will have it and be able to um, articulate your comment or your question. So remember to do that. Disclosures. Um, a summary of disclosures from our speakers, moderators, and planning committee members is available on the informational slides. Uh, and those disclosures include that Dr. Jennifer Wagner discloses she's employed by Geisinger Health System and has a solo law practice. There are no other disclosures. Uh, so last two things, bear with me, CME and CLE. For those of you here in person, there are two different sets of procedures. If you're here in person and you're requesting continuing medical education credits today, you do need to complete a participant tracker form and the paper evaluation form. They're both at the info desk in the lobby, and you've got to leave them with us here today. That documents that you indeed participated. Uh, and completion of that evaluation form, some of you are old hands at this, you know that's really required to get those CME credits. If you're requesting CLE, continuing legal education credits, either from Minnesota or from Tennessee, uh, you need to complete a participant tracker form too and leave it at the desk. For those of you on our webcast and requesting CME or CLE, you need to email that address, consortm at umn.edu. That documents your involvement on the webcast, and you will be emailed an evaluation form at the conclusion of the day, and you'll need to send that back to us too. So any questions, those of you on webcast, Send them to consortm at umn.edu. We're monitoring it continuously. We'll answer your question and make sure everything's on track. And you know, we have all of our wonderful staff out at the info desk. Don't hesitate to ask them questions. They're the real experts on what we're doing here today. So already, I have a comment. OK. All right. So. Uh, now we're going to switch gears, and I'm going to briefly introduce, I'm thrilled to introduce my colleague, Professor Dana Bowen Matthew. So if you bear with me for a second, Dana. Uh, Dr. Matthew is the William L. Matheson and Robert M. Morgenthau Distinguished Professor of Law and F. Palmer Weber Research Professor of Civil Liberties and Human Rights at the University of Virginia School of Law. She's the author of a spectacular book that I recommend to everyone called Just Medicine, A Cure for Racial Inequality in American Healthcare. Professor Matthew has also taken on a great many public policy roles, including co-founding the Colorado Health Equity Project, serving as senior advisor to the director of the Office of Civil Rights for the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, and serving as a member of the health policy team for U.S. Senator Debbie Stabenow of Michigan. Please join me in welcoming Dana Bowen Matthew. As I was driving in, I was very emotional because it turns out um, that I passed by the exact location where my father-in-law graduated from Meharry. Um, I've tried to um, get the exact date, um, and maybe it'll come up on my watch before the end of my talk, but um, I quick, quick um, added a picture of him at the end and uh, feel emboldened by his memory, so I might... Um, be a little much for you early in the morning because I've really been inspired by being on this hallowed ground uh, of Meharry uh, Medical College. So thank you to the organizers. Thank you very much for the privilege of speaking to you. It's wonderful for a lawyer to be invited in the midst of the um, medical profession and in the midst of so many research scientists. I did go back and get a PhD just so that I could add that to my name and you would let me in the door. But as you well know, I, um, I am impassioned by the justice issues and so um, you'll have to bear with me because those, those will be the topics that I'd like to level set for us today 
um, as we begin to talk about advancing the health of underserved populations through genomics and precision medicine. So as we all know, in January 2015, President Barack Obama, it, it, it feels like, it was only three years ago, but it feels like a very long time ago, doesn't it? Three long years ago. Um, announced that Precision Medicine, <clears throat> the initiative, uh, would develop a nationwide infrastructure um, to bring precision medicine into the clinical setting in the United States. And of course, the concern immediately was that the effective, preventive, therapeutic medicine uh, that would result would be distributed equally, um, equitably, and accessible to all so that uh, personalized medicine would be a benefit that would personally uh, accrue to all members of society. So today's proceedings, of course, are dedicated to exploring ways in which law and ethics might ensure that this promise of uh, genomic and precision medicine is fulfilled across the entire population. Um, indeed, it will only be so if we admit and account for the fact that we start at a place where we are not equal, right? Where the resources that are required in order to be healthy are already inequitably distributed. If we do not pay attention to the fact that this is our condition precedent, that this is true today, then whatever benefits there are to accrue from the work that will be done by precision medicine and genomics will in fact perpetuate, exacerbate, and perhaps even widen, exacerbate the gaps um, in, uh, in health outcomes that populations experience today. Um, so today's uh, proceedings are really about health justice. And that's why the lawyer is in the room. Health justice, I'm, I'm putting up this very familiar slide just to pause for a minute and, and, and make sure that we level set about what we mean by health justice. This is, of course, the Robert Wood Johnson uh, Foundation's graphic to show what equality and equity are and how they're different. Uh, and I'll borrow from Paula Braveman's very wonderful definition um, and reference the fact that uh, health justice what we are looking to achieve in the precision medicine and genomic medicine spaces is the elimination of all differences that are unfair, avoidable, and unjust. And we don't do this by making sure everybody gets the same medicine. It is done by making sure that we are precise about the needs and the social context of each of the individuals that will be served by the medical system. Again, one more level setting diagram, which is of course familiar to all. I want to address two elephants in the room, and one is the fact that we know for a fact now that only a very small portion of health outcomes are determined by genetics and biology, and only a small portion are determined by clinical care. Therefore, since we know that most of medical outcomes are relatable to and determined by the social determinants of health, that is the environment, the social factors, and even health behaviors, I would argue, are influenced by these health uh, context and environmental factors, what then can we expect precision medicine to do that would be meaningful? This is the elephant in the room, right? At the individual level, how would precision medicine actually make a difference to these very vast and important structural issues? Well, I would like to suggest that one answer is this. If you do not pay attention to these structural issues, they will guarantee that any benefits that accrue from precision medicine will be inequitably distributed along the lines of the inequities of social determinants, right? Of course, the second elephant in the room, and I'm going to raise it now um, before I actually get into the meat of my comments, is what are we doing going backwards if we've now finally reached almost consensus that race is a social construct, aren't we going to 
deconstruct that? Aren't we going to dismantle that? If we begin to look at genetic diversity, if we begin to look at the individual uh, differences on genetic basis, aren't we in danger of reintroducing the old eugenics lie? I'm at the University of Virginia now, right, where eugenics had its heyday. Uh, are we in the danger of reintroducing that lie uh, that people are genetically different and therefore we should sort them by the inferior and superior statuses. Yes, we are in that danger. And that is why it is so important that the physician scientists who are part of the, physician, of the precision medicine movement are cognizant of that danger and study in light of that danger and make sure that this e equity and law and social issues stay front and center at the table and the, the discussion as we begin to really explore and develop this new wonderful world of precision medicine. Why? Let me get a little wonky for one slide and talk about the theory that supports my uh, advocacy clearly this morning. And it is fundamental cause theory. Perhaps you're familiar with the work of Bruce and uh, Bruce Link and Joe Phelan. Um, and they did, in 1994, five, excuse me, a very important service to the sociology and understanding of health outcomes and how they differ from populations. And this was their message. Not only is socioeconomic status a fundamental cause of health disparities, but, here's the R word, racism is a fundamental cause of health disparities. And what is meant by fundamental cause is very important to understand, yes? So there are differences in health outcomes that could be explained once we control for socioeconomic status, for median household income, for educational attainment, for occupational status, and so forth. That's the blue circle in this graphic. However, there are differences that remain and are not explained because they are related to and relatable to the race of populations. Fundamental cause theory tells us that this distance, this difference will continue to be expressed because of the systemic nature of the causes of those differences, even when we introduce advancements even when we introduce medical miracles, those differences will not reach vulnerable populations for whom race and racism continue to be the fundamental cause of their differences, unless we account for that fact. The best example, of course, is smoking cessation information, right? So we have this wonderful understanding of how dangerous tobacco is and the uptake across the uh, polity across the society has been high among populations that are well educated, among populations that are well resourced. But even the most important advances in information, even the most important cessation information does not reach populations that are low income, that are low resourced unless we deliberately make sure that the advances are directed towards accounting for those differences. The same is true where differences in health have been influenced by structural differences that we call racism. So what is racism? Racism is a system and it is associated, we know by a strong and large robust body of research with health disparities. And let me be clear, I don't mean race and I don't mean racial differences. Racism I'm defining as a structural institutionalized and very often legally enabled system of differences that allocate resources on the false perception that one or another group is superior or inferior to another one, right? So let me say the summary of that again. Racism is a system, right? It is not the case as many suggest, including our president, that when you raise the word race, you are a racist. That is not what racism implies. Racism implies a system that is institutionalized, 
that sorts people and resources based on a false assumption of their relative status. And we know that structural racism is associated with health outcomes. This is just one meta-analysis. There are several community level racism, when you measure it, for example, by, just for an example, when you measure it by the number of online searches for racial epithets and sort those geographically, you find that the higher the density of those online searches for the N-word and other racial epithets, the more likely there will be a wider disparity in mortality rates between blacks and whites. Interestingly, when you measure structural racism by express or explicit views of hatred and race, violent, uh, race animus, not only do you see adverse health effects on populations who were targeted by those racial epithets, but you see decreases in longevity and life expectancy in populations that are white as well. So I, as a lawyer, can cap encapsulate this body of research by telling you that racism hurts and harms health for all populations. This is another study, a wonderful one. It's an older study that was done, and I, 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 I cite it because it's very um, uh, good at uh, looking at individual level racism, disrespect and race, and its community level impacts on, again, both black and white populations. Right? I'm only giving you a sample here. Structural racism, this is one of my favorites, and its association with myocardial infarction. Right? And to measure racism in this study, the researchers created a five-part index, which included gaps in incarceration rates, gaps in political participation rates, residential segregation, gaps in educational attainment and economic and job gaps, right? And where those indices were the widest, they found an association of higher incidents of and disparities between black and white deaths due to heart attack. Um, the last one, my personal favorite, because I believe that health impacts are measured not only in outputs or outcomes like am I, or life expectancy, but in social disparities such as in this study, measuring the association between structural racism and fatal shootings by police of unarmed victims, right? So again, this is a study that looks at the relationship between structural racism and the gap between shootings of black unarmed victims and white unarmed victims by police officers. So how did they structure this measure of racism, right? If you are not getting the message, let me be explicit by it. The reason we have this information is because people are careful to study it, and I'm asking you as physician scientists to continue in like fashion as you advance precision medicine. Why? Because this is the type of disparity information that we as legal interveners can speak to and improve health outcomes from the legal side, right? So here, let me summarize this study again. An index, in this case, four different domains. Residential segregation turns out to be the most influential and most impactful that is related to the difference in probability that an unarmed victim who is black versus white will be shot by police officers. Look at the beta coefficient that associates segregation with the disparity between black and white fatal police shootings, right? So the point of all of this is to encourage you to consider five characteristics that I'd like to suggest of precision medicine studies as you implement your work in a way that will achieve health justice and health equity. And I suggest these humbly because I am a social scientist, not a clinical scientist. But I do know, first of all, that if you intend to accomplish and serve health justice, 
in the work of precision medicine and genomic medicine, you must consider the social and environmental factors that are affecting patients at a structural level and how those express themselves in the genetic makeup. You must consider issues relevant to the inequities that the populations you will be studying and serving are impactful and how they impact the medicine and the precision that you are seeking to give and in fact include them. So the second feature of studies is that they must be inclusive. And of course, this is what all of us is about, right? All of us is about making sure that you include diverse groups, that social, socioeconomic, racial diversity is reflected in sufficient power to have meaningful results. And I will tell you, it took me a while to fill out all of the information required to enroll in all of us, even though I am a social science researcher, I'm a health justice advocate, I'm a lawyer, I understand, I go to the precision medicine, but I paused for days, wondering if I could trust putting my information in, given the history of what has been done. And I guarantee you that in order to make sure that all of us meets its goals of being the largest longitudinal and inclusive study, you will have to account for the fact that, yes, even I, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, will have hesitancy and fear that is well-founded about participating. Thirdly, I suggest that you must oversample populations that are vulnerable. Why? Because currently, the samples of populations are, of course, largely based on people of European ancestry. So study techniques must oversample those with a greater disease burden and those, that means those are historically underrepresented, and those with high within group genetic diversity, descendants from Africa. And when you do that, it is important to understand, fourth, the epigenetic diversity that results from this. I was speaking earlier um, and about the fact that I was born to a mother who lived in the Jim Crow South. And the likelihood that I carry a different genetic makeup or that some of the stress of the racism that she endured transferred to me is not trivial. Understanding this better and the impact that it has will influence whether you distinguish differences that are due to race or the consequences of race and race status in the United States. I'll say that one more time because it's so important. As you continue to advance precision medicine and genomics, it is essential that you understand the differences that are racial, not due to race qua race, but rather due to the status of race and how it is treated as a consequence is of living in the United States. And lastly, I'll say privacy is an issue. Just apropos of my story of being concerned even as an educator, as a researcher, with enrollment in all of us. It is important that you understand that people who already suffer stigma and who already suffer fear as a result of the history of misappropriation of their genetic information will need increased assurances that their privacy and protection from stigma is going to be, uh, is going to be respected in order for you to, in fact, have inclusive genetic diversity in your studies. So I return now to the relationship between law and the precision medicine and genomic medicine movements that you are engaged in and that will occupy uh, and produce such amazing and exciting um, discoveries in the future. So our society is organized by a constitution, by a declaration of independence. It is organized by the notion that all men and women are created equal. And what law does is attempt, but very much after the fact, to make sure that that is true. I'm married to a doctor and so I know how unpopular it is 
for me to walk into a room and tell you all the ways that the law can, after the fact, try and encourage you in, uh, in, in making this dream of equality true. Um, it is because we have a society that was organized by this type of discrimination and this type of redlining that we continue to have legal tools that are designed for this type of discrimination. But let me assure you that the past is never past. I think it was William Faulkner who said that, right? Not only are the redlined districts that were present as a result of the federal government's blatantly race discrimination or racial discriminatory policies for lending very much present in the organization of segregated communities today, very much present in the access to food sources today, or the inequitable access to housing stock that is both affordable and safe and meets building code standards. These types of discrimination still relate today. Of course, you heard in the introduction that I spent my time in the Michigan Senator's office during the declaration of the lead health crisis, right? And we know that Flint, Michigan is 56% black, 47% poor. Um, I might have reversed those statistics. Uh, largely poor, largely black, and the resources, clean water, clean air, available to those populations continue to reflect the discrimination of yesteryear. Indeed, the past is not past. What can you do? So for the few of you in the room that have gotten a sense of the passion, maybe you had it before you came into the room, let me tell you that in addition to the five study characteristics that I hope you will take away from this talk, that a few of you will come with me to Capitol Hill. Why? When I was on Capitol Hill, really and truly, to be honest with you, I was a glorified intern. And my job was to take constituent calls. That means, because this is the United States of America, you and you and you can knock on your congressman's door, your representative's door, your congresswoman's door, and say, I am from the state of Tennessee. I am your constituent. I have something to say, and we will listen. So my job was to take these calls, and I would take them for anybody who showed up. I get a sort of catch in my throat thinking about how America is an accessible democracy in this way and how we must take advantage of it. But here's the message I want to leave with you. When that constituent was a physician, I gave them double time. What you say matters. People listen to you. And the reason I hustled to get my father-in-law's picture to add to this, he was a Meharry graduate. No, I cannot tell you what year. It had to be before 1950, blah, 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 I'm not saying, right? Um, but this is a picture from the New York Times, and he is doing what I am asking you to do. Ironically, I am going to go ahead and tell the story. Ironically, this story is about the fact that he was charged with misappropriating Medicaid funds to do what? To address the social determinants of health. Right? So back in 1963, he was trying to use Medicaid funds to do substance and, uh, substance and uh, use and tr treatment for uh, addicts. He was trying to use Medicaid funds to provide housing for the homeless. And he was trying to use Medicaid funds to provide job training in order to fulfill medical contracts. For that, he went to jail. For that, he went to jail on Christmas Day. But he was pardoned by President Richard Nixon. And so this is a bipartisan speech. <laughs> in order to encourage you, please, not only to do your science in a way that is responsible and responsive to health justice, but to step outside of the halls of your laboratories, your clinics, your hospitals, and your medical settings and come with me to speak on behalf of your patient populations about the need for health justice in the United States. So thank you for listening.
All right, the floor is open. Uh, could you come up to the mic or we can get a mic to you either way? Thank you. Exercise. Yeah. And if you wouldn't mind just introducing yourself. So that area, everybody was health, you know, everybody uh, yeah. had health disparities, no matter what race or social economic group. That's the first one. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, um, yeah, the studies by um, Che, uh, David Che, if I'm not mistaking his uh, first name, and if, you, if that's wrong, email me and I'll give you the actual citation for that study. Um, and it was uh, on online Google searches, mainly for the N-word, uh, a procedure that has actually been used to correlate with voting patterns. So he decided to try it um, with health outcomes. And yes, mortality of blacks and whites was reduced the higher the density of the searches. Now he did eliminate N words that would appear in rap songs, for example. Oh, so yeah. certain spellings were eliminated. The other one is, uh, have, you, have you ever heard of Dr. Fully Love's uh, work on uh, multiple displacement syndrome? No. Justification, multiple displacement. Yeah, I would be interested in yeah, having that. Good stuff. We can talk later. That'd be great. Thank you. I wanted to throw in a question. So um, part of what brings us here today, as we mentioned, is this NIH-funded LawSeq project, which is asking the question, how should law change? in order to address, uh, in order to support precision medicine and genomic medicine advancing, and advancing in a way that really makes progress mm. with the issues that you've so, you know, uh, dramatically illustrated for us. What advice do you have for us? How should law change? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll be comprehensive, but spend the time on the one that I think would be most interesting to this audience. I think we need to return a private cause of action for discrimination to Title VI, right? Um, I think we need to change the standard of, um, of discriminatory behavior that is actionable from intentionality only, right? Um, basically reverse Sandoval also, um, but also include unintentional discrimination. So the air should go out of the room right now until I get to the number three, like unintentional discrimination. Everybody does that. How can I make that actionable? Here's how I think you can make it actionable. What I would like to see the law do is set a reasonableness standard so that people, entities, organizations who are acting reasonably in light of the knowledge that implicit bias affects health outcomes have a defense to a cause of action alleging discrimination and people who don't do not, right? So the incentive is not to sue you, right? I used to litigate for a living. It is an inefficient and largely clumsy way in order to change behavior and achieve equity. I, I do it, did it for a living. It works eventually. But generally, what I would much rather see is a legal signal that said, as long as you are using the social science literature to address implicit bias, right? As long as you're using the social science literature in a way that reflects the reality of what we've seen in Tarloff's understanding of the social determinants of health and how they impact disparities, right? And you're looking at the outcomes of your delivery of health care in light of implicit bias, all I ask is that you work on addressing the reality of implicit bias. So that's why I want implicit bias and unconscious bias to be actionable, but on a reasonableness basis. Does that make sense? And um, so let me just also close by saying, um, the way you get there is with better science, right? We believe in evidence-based lawmaking like you believe in evidence-based medicine. Right? If I can understand better the extent to which discriminatory systems are correlated and associated with 
poor health outcomes on a disproportionate and disparate basis, then I have the quantitative evidence to go to Capitol Hill and say, this is the nature of discrimination today. It doesn't look like that sign I had up that says we don't want you in our neighborhood. It looks differently and therefore we should regulate it differently as a legal matter. Professor, thank you so much for the really very compelling um, discussion so far. I'm Consuela Wilkins with the Meharry Vanderbilt Alliance. Um, and I spend a fair amount of time in the precision medicine space now. Um, and a lot of the discussion is just about really clinical, biological, some health data from wearables. Uh, but largely the environmental data, um, the way perhaps a social scientist might see it or someone who studies health equity might see it, is missing. Um, so I wonder if you have suggestions for how we can actually get more of that health equity lens to the table so that we can embed things like you know, uh, response time, uh, police response time in neighborhoods, um, the red lining, the, s some of these things that are being studied really thoughtfully but are largely disregarded in traditional clinical and translational research. So thank you for the question. The first thing I will say, Dr. Wilkins, is today is the first day that I met you, but your reputation precedes you. And so the first part of my answer is we need more people like you at the table doing what you do. And um, just it's an honor to, to be a part of a program that includes you. So thank you for the question. But that really is the first answer. Um, it is not a fool's errand to make sure that the workforce, um, the medical workforce, is diversified, right? because we will have more Dr. Wilkins asking and answering the same types of questions, but in a different way, with a different lens. That is a really important voice and an important thing to do. But secondly, I showed you the studies that correlate structural racism with health outcomes for a reason. I showed them to you to ask you to do more of that work. Because to the extent that we understand, to use your example, that response time for police um, to violent trauma um, is correlated in the way that the ACEs study has shown us with life course disparities in health. Then we can make sure that when we see differences that are studied by quote unquote race as a variable, we don't mistake that for race genetically. We understand that that is race contextually, right? So I often tell the story, I have three children, all, thank God, grown and out of the house. And when I moved to my new home in Washington, D.C., I literally took a picture of my 27-year-old son around to my neighbors. I said, this, this person, this is my son. If you see him, do me a favor, don't call the police. I get along with my neighbors really well. They are good people. They are not racists, right? But I will tell you that I bear a stress with respect to how my son will be received and perceived in a new neighborhood that white mothers do not, right? My allostatic load has been bearing that since he learned to ride a bicycle by himself. Lord help me when he got in a car. And that was true for my daughter. And that's true for every mother of color. And it must be at the table to understand that my immune system, my cortisol levels, all of those things will be reflective of that situational reality because of the color of my skin. Okay, let's do one more question, Jen. Thank you, sorry, Jen Wagner from Geisinger. Thank you for your talk, it was amazing. Your three points, I completely agree. I'm wondering if you could touch a little bit about the viability of deliberate indifference as a means to get at dis disparate impact th as actually disparate t treatment. If we're ignoring the science about implicit bias and structural bias, is that deliberate indifference? Yeah, I like that a lot. Um, I, I just heard this. Um, you and I should probably talk because uh, you know, I'm in a group that's trying to figure out how do, we, how do we come up with new standards. And I started with the reasonableness standard and someone said, you know, a deliberate indifference is a little better. It protects a, a lot more. It gives a lot more room. And I like the idea 
that I'm asking you to produce more science so that I can say if you deliberately ignore that science, then that's actionable, right? That's the way the law can work. The law can work by saying when there is behavior that we as a collective believe is reasonable, right? And you don't do that, right? That's all a crime is. Right? It is a crime because we collectively believe that you shouldn't take things that don't belong to you. So when you do that, we say you are deliberately indifferent to the societal rule that says don't do that, right? So I love the deliberate indifference standard. I think it's a really good idea, and I probably could sell it in this audience a little bit better than the reasonableness standard, so thanks very much let's, for let's that. Let's talk yeah. later. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think so. I think so. And let me just say, all I'm talking about, I, I know you're going to pull me off with that hook, so this is, a, this is the last thing I would say. If you think about the paradigm shift, if you're old enough, uh, that happened around privacy, um, you understand that HIPAA is a word that people know before they get into medical school, right? You pay attention to the privacy rights of people. Why? Because the legal paradigm set, this is the expressive value of law, the legal paradigm set patient privacy and confidentiality as a new value that everyone should respect. I am saying to you that equity is a similar new value that everyone should, should respect. And I would like to construct a legal paradigm that gives you the room to do just that, to take whatever steps you would take, for example, to respect privacy. You have people trained, you have online courses, you have a, um, a, an administrator who's in charge, people have to certify, all of those things. You don't need me as a lawyer to tell you how to do that, right? You don't need me as a lawyer to tell you how to do precision medicine equitably. My goal would be just to ask you to operate within a paradigm and I'll ask law to create that paradigm that respects the high, important, central value and goal of health justice. Thanks. <laughs>